Now, the last time we spoke to Kate, she was actually here in the studio, but she can't be with us right here today uh, as it is, unfortunately, not least because we're in sort of lockdown two, although it doesn't always seem like that when you walk around London. But let's say a very good afternoon uh, to Baroness Harry. Kate, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Mike. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I know you were in the House of Lords a little bit earlier on this week, but you're back in uh, uh, in, in the homestead, I take it, in, in Northern Ireland. How are things over there at the moment? Well, we're in a, a little bit at the moment of uh, everybody waiting because we were told four weeks ago that tonight at midnight, the, um, the, res- the extra restrictions that had been brought in for four weeks, which meant no one could visit anyone in their homes, no. the pubs were closed, not quite as st- strict as in England, uh, would end. And uh, none of the parties, the parties can't agree in uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, at midnight tonight, we will go back to the original sort of restrictions, which were not nearly as as strong, unless there's some kind of compromise comes up today. But even if the compromise comes up today, it takes a couple of days before the legal requirements happen. So we're in this sort of limbo situation. And there's one or two of the pubs have already said in restaurants that they're just going to open because they're fed up not getting you know absolute um that you know their businesses are being destroyed yes. and they have they have done everything they can to keep uh covid safe and yet they're being told that after four weeks they can't maybe they can't open right so technically you're going back to what sounds like a sort of tier three situation then are you? Y- yes I, I i mean i to be honest i think and it's the theme all over i think there's there's an awful lot more people now beginning to realize that they're going to have to start to learn to live with this until there's a vaccine and even then no one's going to know whether that's going to work particularly right. uh, and um, that they should be using their common sense and and you know an awful lot of people are using their common sense already which is why there are people who are not absolutely abiding by mm. the rules and regulations and all your stuff about care homes is you know it really is ridiculous and just this week in the house of lords there was a question because um what the government has done is said that they'll make it quite easy and help to allow people who want to go to Switzerland to take their own lives, yeah. um, that they'll help them do that. But yet they won't allow people to go in and, 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 and visit their elderly parents who perhaps or haven't got very much longer to live anyway no. and have no, no worry about getting COVID. But this is it. I mean, we had a terrible call a couple yesterday, actually, one from a woman called Janet in Newcastle, whose, whose father mm. was in a care home. And she said, you know, back in March, he was healthy, he was happy. You know, he played the saxophone, he played the piano, he was in a choir, he used to go out and about and do stuff. And they, she had no complaints yeah. about the actual care home itself or the people in the care home. But she said that uh, on March uh, sort of 26 or 27th, it was declared that he couldn't see anybody. Um, and he just deteriorated to such an extent yeah, and absolutely. became so miserable and depressed that he took his own life. And it's just absolutely. awful. And it must be happening well, you know, even, up and down the country. Even someone like myself, you know, and I, I, I'm lucky that I can, can go to work in, in, in London if I, if, I, if I needed to. Mm. But even I'm, you know, so frustrated that I can't go and visit. I had a cousin um, sadly pass away this week and I wasn't able to go and visit the home of of the um, uh, the wife of, right. of, of my cousin. And, and, you know, these are the sorts of things that begin to just grind yeah. people down and mm. if you're on your own completely it's bound to be bad for mental health and for just general depression which yes. i think we're all suffering from particularly when it's bad weather well i think especially now because it's darker in the afternoon now you're sort of you know dealing with you know suddenly it's dark at five o'clock and you don't see any light of any, of any kind really until about seven in the morning and i think an awful lot of people because it's been going on for so long have forgotten almost what ordinary life used to be like because you do. Yeah. I mean, I see pictures from, say, this time last year. I've got this thing that pops up now on my iPad, you know, sort of random picture selection. And you just go, yeah. blimey, look at all those people. And it just yeah. looks weird, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Although I was surprised, I have to say, London this week when I was over was much more movement and oh, yes. people than there was in the last lockdown. Yeah. So clearly people are doing, as we said, they're actually using their common sense and mm. they're going out if they feel sensible about, enough about doing that yeah which kind of i mean and i'm, I'm not going to complain about that because i think that's good but mm, in, I, but it sort of gives the lie to what we're actually doing for four weeks because as far as i'm concerned when the lockdown came in last thursday uh, a week ago the roads were just as busy as they had been before that um the shops uh, around here which were open have remained open borough market yesterday i went over there and there's people standing around drinking there's people eating there's people shopping you know mm. there's an awful lot of activity which is which is good obviously but i mean i don't understand why london which apparently has a very low infection rate right now uh, is even doing it yeah well i i i think that the whole to treat the whole 
countries are saying when you're looking at different areas with different uh, levels is, is, is just silly. And um, also this word essential, you know, mm. what is essential to you right. uh, might not be essential to me. I was I was actually looking for a pair of tights this week. Yes. And I, I genuinely find it <laughs> Im- almost impossible in the end to to find a pair of tights right. anywhere because there's nothing open. Yeah, well, I mean, I wanted to buy a That's jacket. That's quite essential to me. Well, I'm sure it is. I mean, not so much for me. I mean, I've got loads of pairs at home, so it's not a problem. But no, I mean... Uh... I should have borrowed a pair. <laughs> no, I mean, the thing is, yeah, if I, wanted, I wanted to go and buy a couple of jackets the other day, and I thought, I don't even know where I can go, because I don't no. actually know anymore what's open and what isn't open. I was told no. the other day that Blue Water uh, over in Essex, the big shop- shopping centre there, is largely open. And most of the shops are open, even if it's only for cl- click and collect. But you can physically go there and, and get something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we're we're in a we're in a, a bit of a shambles, to mm. be honest. And I think the sooner. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't have the answer because, of course, I, I don't want you. No one wants to be accused of being, um, you know, complicit in, in, in the deaths of people. But I think more and more um, government has to accept that they are not they have not actually um manage to take people with them. Mm. Uh, I think that's the big problem at the moment. I mean, I had a call just before uh, the uh, top of the hour there from a a businessman in Scotland. I think he was probably running a cab company or something. He said, look, we just need some certainty. We just need some kind of idea of when this is all kind of come to an end so that we can make plans. Because without knowing anything, really, we don't know if Christmas is going to be fine or not fine. I'd like to to be able to say to my daughter, she can fly in from Dubai. um, And whether she has to quarantine or not, she can come and spend Christmas with us, you know, nobody knows what's going on. And what's the criteria? Because in Northern Ireland, it, it's now gone down the R rate, this this amazing R rate that everyone talks about yeah. without probably understanding. I'm not saying I do either, but it points seven, you know, mm. and we, we were told that if it was under one, things could be... Yeah, that means, to, that means you're infecting less than one exactly. person, exactly. so that should be fine. But that's not, that's not made any difference. But mm. there we are. Okay, how did you find the House of Lords? Because obviously this you're <laughs> what could be called as a, you could be described as a newbie, I think, without fear or favour. Well, that's absolutely right. And, and this was, I, I had my first question this week, which was actually on the American election, because I, I wanted to, I, I made it very specific uh, that I said, if um, Biden, Joe Biden is, is, ele- is formally declared yes. president. But of course, the uh, minister responding didn't uh, in any way take that up. But I was basically pointing out that, you know, it, it if if, if uh, Joe Biden was elected, he would be the most Irish nationalist president that there'd ever been mm. uh, for many many years, and that uh, might be would it be sensible for our ambassador in Washington to actually give him a copy of the Belfast Agreement? Yes, uh, and the minister, of course, didn't answer that. Well, then we had the debate on the um, Internal Market Bill, right. and I'm afraid one of the things about the House of Lords, of course, it has got huge expertise in inverted commas because you have people there who've been top of business top of legal sections top of everything practically in the country but there's an awful lot of lawyers and the lawyers really took over the debate Mm. on the internal market and so then you get stuck into the sort of minutiae presumably of little clauses here there and everywhere and and which you know lawyers who all do seem to feel that they they know more than you know, people, rank and file people. So there were a few of us, Claire Fox, myself, uh, Peter Lilly. There were, I think we had about seven or eight speakers mm. who were in favour of the Internal Market Bill in the sections on um, the, the protocol on Northern Ireland, yes. which all does sound a bit confusing to people, but actually it's very simple. The, gov- the government went into the election with a manifesto commitment that there would be unfettered access of goods between Northern Ireland and the European Union. The European Union has not been being very um, sensible or flexible about the relationship after the transition period ends. And so the internal market bill is being brought in as a safeguard. And it's not actually implemented just by passing it. But the law, the legal sections of the House of Lords were absolutely, this was tr- absolutely dreadful. We were mm. breaking international law. We were pariahs oh, in the yes. world. You know, I would say that most people in this country, never name the rest of the world, um, really do feel that if we want to stand up for our country, that should go ahead of anything else, um, and that if you're if you're actually breaking, uh, you, I mean, breaking international law is a very wide term. Yes, and and uh, I think the, the mistake was that um, the minister in the House of Commons, when it was first announced, actually used the word breaking international law, whereas actually you could argue that it's just simply. Right. Um, you know, making making sure that we have a mechanism that if the European Union 
doesn't show good faith, which I don't have much faith in them showing good mm. faith, then we can do something about it. Well, my understanding is that uh, we would only be breaking international law if the EU broke it first. And that would be when our move afterwards would create us uh, in to be, being in breach of something. But I've also seen uh, pieces written about how often uh, international law is in uh, fact broken, particularly by countries in the European Union. Absolutely. And it's dozens and dozens of times a year. Absolutely. And Germany is a, a classic example yeah. of that over uh, some of the recent um, issues to do with debt and so on. And Germany seems to be able to do it. And nobody says a word because the European Union kind of acts as a... It, I, I, I'm, I'm so surprised almost well, I'm, I'm disappointed how many, you know, educated people in politics actually still see the European Union as somehow anything they say mm. has to be listened to and agreed with. Whereas if our government, whatever the politics of the party and government says, somehow that isn't, you know, there just is no feeling that our country uh, could be doing the right thing and the European Union yeah. could be wrong. No, so, indeed. Uh, it's incredible, isn't it? And that's, I watched in with some incred incredulity at the weekend as sort of the media got involved in this love-in with Joe Biden, who you and I oh. both agree has not yet been declared the President of the United States. Absolutely. Uh, elect or otherwise. Um, because they thought, actually, that he would somehow stop Brexit. I mean, it's such a deluded um, state of mind that some of these people seem to be in. Guys like Adam Bolton uh, ra raving on about how great this is going to be uh, for Ireland and how great it's going to be. He's going to be more friendly yeah. to Ireland. And then, of course, it was all about how he's not going to be interested in Boris Johnson because he thinks he's just like Trump. And then he rings Boris as the first guy <laughs> In Europe that he talks yeah, to. I thought, I thought that was lovely. And of course, I mean, you know, it's of course, Mike, you're part of the media, but I mean, talk radio is slightly different from mm. most of the media. But, you know, it is it is ridiculous the way so much of our news is now made almost by journalists with their own views yeah. uh, in terms of, of, of setting the agenda. And, and that, that, you know, it was it was quite it was quite ridiculous, really, how the, the, particularly the BBC on mm. the whole American election. Um, you know, were just could not actually hide the fact that they were just so thrilled that it looked like maybe Trump had 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 lost, and then were determined to tell us that he'd lost mm. even before legally and officially he'd been told. Exactly. He'd lost. And if it does turn out that Biden wins in the end, I mean, I don't, I don't buy this narrative that he's going to be difficult with Britain no. at all. I really no. think he needs Britain as much as Britain needs America. Um, you and, know, and there, there's so many people in America. Who, 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 you know, or f who understand or like the United Kingdom. I just can't see uh, it. The special relationship is a special relationship because we've got that hugely important thing about language, haven't we? Yes. You know, if you speak the same language, even with an American accent, it's it's much, much easier to uh, to sort of work together. And, and we're I, much I, more I, culturally I together as well, aren't we? I mean, mm -hmm. America has very little in common with France or Germany uh, or Portugal or Spain or Italy. Um, and maybe Italy actually more so because they've got a lot of Italian Americans. But you know, very small. You know, the big countries of Europe not very much uh, in common at all with America. No, we've we're definitely in, and and, and I thought that was just great that um, you know um, Boris Johnson did get, I think, the second call after Canada, yeah. which which is pretty natural, uh, and and was a bit of a. Um, but of course, you didn't see many of the media coming out and admitting then. Oh, no. Well, in fact, it was quite the reverse, because the day before the call was made, um, they were saying how ridiculous it was that Boris probably wouldn't even be one of the first 10 calls and how terrible yeah. that was going to be. And when he was the first one in Europe, then it turned out that actually the, the pecking order didn't matter. You know, they no. said, oh, well, that's not important. You know, it doesn't mean anything. So no. just bizarre. So um, all I can say, um, Kate, is hopefully we'll see you back here soon. Um, yes. And Mike, uh, can I say something? Can we all be watching Northern Ireland tonight? Yes. If we, beat, if we beat Slovakia and Scotland, of course, have an important match too. But, you know, it, sometimes people, I think, forget that there are four teams in the home nations. Absolutely. And Northern Ireland matters as well. And if well, we Northern beat Slovakia... Ireland, we Northern Ireland qualified... also been, has given people a lot of pleasure over the years recently. Yes, because we've got fantastic supporters. Unfortunately, there's only a 1,000 allowed in tonight, which, again, I think is just ridiculous. Yes. Well, but... listen, we will keep an eye out for them. Wish them all luck. And Kate, great to talk to you. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Baroness Kate Hoey of Lyle and Rathlin, of course, over in uh, Northern Ireland, non-affiliated peer. Uh, a great addition to the House of Lords, I have to tell you. One of the few sensible people in there uh, we will be talking to on a regular basis. Come